evening. For our opening hymn this evening, you can turn to number 51 in your hymnal. Guide me, O the great Jehovah. I'll invite you to stand with me, please. Number 51. Father, once again, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. We're here around your word. We're here with music, singing praise to your holy name. How do we begin to thank you, Lord, for having drawn us to your precious son, uh, the salvation that we know and experience through him? We can face anything that the world has for us, and uh, we need to be reminded of that. Help us to remember to be in the world, being a light shining for you, but not to be a part of the world, and not especially not to to love it, put it up as an idol that we, uh, we adore and appreciate more than we appreciate you and your precious son. Pray that you go with us through this hour. Help us to examine ourselves carefully. Root out every uh, potential uh, sin, every besetting, befalling thing that uh, takes our affection away from you, causes us to sin. We would want to be more like our Savior, and it's only through your empowerment, your help, word that you give us. Those are the only ways that we're going to prevail. We need you, Lord. So come and speak to us. Um, just as Peter remarked to you when he answered and said, Lord, to whom else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. It is you that we want to be all about. Show us that way tonight. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. For our second song this evening, it'll be number 471. 471, the way of the cross leads home.
I'll invite you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 9. We've been making our way consecutively through the book of Ezekiel on our Sunday night scripture readings. And if my sloppy record keeping is right, we're in chapter 9 tonight. Ezekiel chapter 9. It's a big book, should make it easy to find if you just know where to look. Ezekiel chapter 9 begins like this. Then he cried in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen with a writing case at his waist. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing case at his waist. And Yahweh said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. I hope that I would have received that mark. Right? I hope I would be groaning and sighing about the abominations in Jerusalem. Verse 5, And to the others he said in my hearing, Pass through the city after him and strike. Your eyes shall not spare, and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the house. Then he said to them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. So they went out and struck in the city. And while they were striking, and I was left alone, I fell on my face and cried, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in the outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, The guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of blood and the city full of injustice. For they say the Lord has forsaken, her, has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. As for me, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will bring their deeds upon their heads. And behold, the man clothed in linen with the writing case at his waist brought back word saying, I have done as you have commanded me. Then I looked, verse 1 of chapter 10, then I looked and behold on the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared above them something like a sapphire in appearance like a throne. And he said to the man clothed in linen, go in among the whirling wheels underneath the cherubim, fill your hands with burning coals from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in before my eyes. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the house when the man went in and a cloud filled the inner court. And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the house and the house was filled with the cloud. And the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Does this sound like a good thing? So far, so good. Verse 5. The sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. And when he commanded the man clothed in linen, take fire from between the whirling wheels, from between the cherubim, he went in and stood beside a wheel. And a cherub stretched out his hand from between the cherubim to the fire that was between the cherubim, And took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed in linen who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a human hand under their wings. And I looked and behold, there were four wheels beside the cherubim, one beside each cherub. And the appearance of the wheels was like sparkling barrel. And as for their appearance, the four had the same likeness as if a wheel were within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of the four directions without turning as they went, but in whatever direction the front wheel faced, the others followed without turning as they went. And their whole body, these wheels, 
Their whole body, their rims and their spokes, their wings and the wheels were full of eyes all around, the wheels that the four of them had. As for the wheels, they were called in my hearing the whirling wheels. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was a human face. The third, the face of a lion. The fourth, the face of an eagle. And the cherub being mounted up. These were the living creatures that I saw by the Chebar Canal. Chebar Canal. When the cherubim went out, the wheels went beside them. When the cherubim lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the wheels did not turn from beside them. When they stood still, these stood still. When they mounted up, these mounted up with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in them. Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went out with the wheels beside them. And they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. Again, so far, so good. These, verse 20, were the living creatures that I saw underneath the God of Israel by the Chebar Canal, and I knew they were cherubim. Each had four faces. Each had four wings. And under, underneath their wings, the likeness of human hands. And as for the likeness of their faces, they were the same faces whose appearance I had seen by the Chebar Canal. Each one of them went straight forward. Where is the glory of God going? The story doesn't seem to end here, does it? Well, we'll wait till next week. Thank you for giving attention to Ezekiel 9 and 10 tonight. Next song tonight would be number 199, number 199, Arise, My Soul, Arise.
last song this evening, I'll have you look to your handout. It will be, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. I'll invite you to stand with me also if you're able.
Isn't there another song now? How many more do you have? Thank you. That's nice. Pastor had us this morning at the beginning of the pastoral prayer thinking about June being Pride Month. But there's a whole lot of stuff going on in June besides Pride Month, right? Ron Berg celebrated his what, his what birthday yesterday? His 82nd birthday yesterday. Good for you. Bob and Shirley had an anniversary yesterday. Um, a whole lot of you appear to have gotten married in June. Must be it's a month to get married in. Where'd Brian go? Hiding behind the monitor? Always out in the, out in the narthex. Where'd Alex go? Out with the young people? Brian, it's your anniversary today. 34 years, good for you. Greg Norris is celebrating a birthday tomorrow. How many years old? 67. Tammy, you're celebrating an anniversary this week. 14 years. Wow. Ray and Kathy, Friday is your anniversary. How many years? 65. Carrie and Ann. Saturday's your anniversary. How many years? 33. Jeff and Brenda. All right, Jeff. You're celebrating an anniversary next week, Tuesday. How many years? 37. And you can't do the math. Twenty twenty four, nineteen ninety eight. That's got to be 36 years, I think. Good for you. Mike and Nikki, you have an anniversary coming up next week, Wednesday. 20 years? Wow. There's all sorts of neat things happening in June. How about a week from Friday? June 14th. What's going on on the 14th? Flag Day. Very good. What's the significance of Flag Day? It's a day to celebrate our flag. Are you proud of your flag? I am too. I am too. You know, on June the 14th, 1777, the Continental Congress adopted a resolution that said this, that the flag of the United States shall be of 13 stripes of alternate red and white with a union of 13 stars of white in a blue field. Why are there more than 13 stars now? There are more states. A union of 13 stars of white and blue in a blue, white in a blue field representing the new constellation. A flag of this design was first carried into battle on a little bit later that year in the Battle of Brandywine. But that didn't get us Flag Day. I understand. It was June the 14th. So somewhere along the line, I think in the summer of 1861, in Hartford, Connecticut, there's a celebration there that celebrated something like a Flag Day. A little bit later in the 1800s, schools all over the United States held Flag Day programs to contribute to the Americanization of immigrant children so they could learn to appreciate our flag too. And that observance caught on with all sorts of communities. The most recognized claim seems to have come from New York. On June the 14th, 1889, now this is a long time after 1777. Jeff could figure that out if he just was a math guy. Professor George Bolts, principal of a free kindergarten for the poor in New York City, had his school hold patriotic ceremonies to observe the anniversary of that Flag Day resolution in 1777. This initiative attracted attention from the State Department of Education, which promptly put it to a halt. No, not really. Which arranged to have the day observed in all public schools. Soon the state legislature in New York passed a law making it the responsibility of the state superintendent of public schools to ensure that schools hold observations, observances, I'm sorry, for Lincoln's birthday, Washington's birthday, Memorial Day, and Flag Day. In 1893 in Philadelphia, the Society of Colonial Dames, I don't know if you women like to be called dames, um, the Society of Colonial Dames, Philadelphia, 1893, succeeded in getting a resolution passed to have the flag displayed on all the city's public buildings. Elizabeth Gillespie, a direct descendant of Benjamin Franklin, the president of that Dame Society, tried to get the city to call June 14th Flag Day and 
Resolutions by women were not granted much notice there in 1893, and it wasn't until 1937 that the Pennsylvania legislature established June 14th as Flag Day, as first, the first time it was a, an official legal holiday. You know, it wasn't until August of 1949 that the United States president, who was president in August of 49, Harry S. Truman, uh, approved, Congress under his presidency approved a national observance of Flag Day. Does our flag have significance to you? Yes, yes. I, I trust you'll proudly display it on the 14th of June. Margaret, from when you were a child, <laughs> are the 13 stars in a circle or just scattered all about? Where did you get this flag? Whew. Margaret has what she claims is an old flag. You should, you should take it to, uh, what's that uh, PBS show where you bring your junk and they, uh, Antiques Roadshow. You should take it sometime when there's an Antiques Roadshow and see what they tell you it's worth. Okay. A local museum. Okay, thanks for that rabbit trail. I appreciate that. <laughs> she says you. She says you're welcome. Our country's flag isn't the only standard that's lifted up. Other nations do the same thing, right? Next month there'll be a whole bunch of nations gathering in Paris, right? And they'll each of those nations will assign an athlete to carry their country's flag. That'd be quite an honor, wouldn't it, to be among the you know, the, the four Jamaican athletes at the Summer Olympics, or whatever, maybe there are more than four, I don't know. Wouldn't that be an honor to be able to carry your country's flag there? That would be a, a cool thing. You know, lifting up a standard didn't start in 1777. It certainly didn't start uh, more recently than that. It goes back a lot further. I want to look with you tonight as we prepare to share in communion at four biblical passages, four biblical examples, two from the Old and two from the New Testament, where a standard is lifted up. The first one of those comes to us in, excuse me, in Exodus chapter 17. Brian began to speak about this this morning. Exodus chapter 17. The first part of Exodus 17 has Moses getting water from the rock, but the latter part of chapter 17 of Exodus, The latter part of chapter 17 has Israel in a battle for its life against Amalek, the Amalekites. I want you to look at what happens here in Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse 8. We read that Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. This is Brian this morning in Sunday school. He's waiting on me to call on him. Uh, whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever, verse 11, he lowered his hand, Amalek Prevailed, But Moses' hands, I suspect it's his deltoid that gets tired, right? It's that muscle across your shoulder. I don't know. How long do you want to hold your hand up? Not, between, not from now until the time the Amalekites are defeated. I, my arms would get, my shoulders would get tired. So Moses' hands, verse 12, grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands. One on one side. The other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua, verse 13, was able to overwhelm Amalek and his people with the sword. Then Yahweh said to Moses in verse 14, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar there and called the name of it Yahweh Nisi, Jehovah Nisi the Lord our banner, the Lord my banner, saying a hand upon the throne of the Lord, 
The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So Moses, in commemorating this time where Israel prevails when his arms are up with his staff in his arms, says, the name of this place now is Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner, lifting up a standard in the same way that an army might hold up the flag to indicate that they're still engaged in the battle. So there's a place in the Old Testament where we see the Lord, our banner. That's sort of our theme tonight. We'll see that played out in the New Testament in a minute. I want to stop next in Numbers chapter 21. This is a passage that will cause Michelle Hicks to ask you a question. Let me see, who should I assign to answer Michelle's question? Brian. Numbers chapter 21. Michelle always has a question about this passage. It's always kind of bothered her. I'm not going to tell you what her question is. I'm not even going to address her question. But if she comes to you, you'll know you have it coming. Numbers chapter 21. The heading here above verse 4 in my Bible is the bronze serpent. So the people of Israel in Numbers chapter 21, according to verse 4, set out from Mount Hor by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. They've been wandering in the wilderness already for a bit. The people became impatient on the way. And the people, verse 5, spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food. There is no water. We loathe this worthless food. What food are they complaining about? The food that God provided that was keeping them alive in the wilderness. We loathe this worthless food. Verse 6. So Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Then the people came to Moses in verse 7 and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to Yahweh that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, I assume out of bronze, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So here is this Standard set up with an object on a pole to which those who were accosted by the judgment of God would look and in looking would be saved, would live. Look and live, my brother live. We'll sing that tonight before we go. Look and live. Well, I don't know, Brian, if you have any idea what Michelle's question is, but you'll, she'll, I'm sure, <laughs> ask you someday. So a snake on a pole. So the two Old Testament examples where the Lord is our banner, one where specifically Moses identifies that place of the battle against the Amalekites as Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner. And then here in Numbers chapter 21, where God has Moses set up on a pole a bronze snake to represent the snakes that are biting them and killing them. And all they had to do was look and live. With that in mind, turn with me to John chapter 3, because Jesus gets engaged in a conversation with a man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and while they're talking, this bronze snake comes up again in John chapter 3. John's gospel, chapter 3, starts out like this. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. Okay, why do you think he came at night? Because he's scared. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus is giving Jesus a bit of affirmation because Jesus can do really amazing things, and Nicodemus wants to affirm him. 
Jesus is not really interested in Nicodemus' affirmation. He says to Nicodemus in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus shakes his head. It says, huh? Where did that come from? I said to you, you must be an amazing man from God because of the things you do. And you say to me, a man has to be born again or born from above. Nicodemus, verse 4, says to Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Of course not. That's ridiculous. That's obviously not what Jesus meant. Jesus answered in verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. I'm not confident that Nicodemus gets it yet. Eventually he will. He'll be around later in Jesus' ministry. He'll be a follower of Jesus. He will understand eventually. But in the, in the moment, in this conversation with Jesus, I'm not sure any of this is making sense to him yet. Jesus continues in verse 8, speaking to Nicodemus. He says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. By the way, he said you have to be born of water and the spirit. That word for spirit, the word for wind, they're both the same thing. The wind blows, verse 8, where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said again to Jesus, how can these things be? I don't get it. Jesus answered him in verse 10, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? Apparently, Nicodemus, as the teacher of Israel, this religious leader, he should have been able to pick this up. His knowledge of the Old Testament should have keyed him in. Verse 11, Jesus says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. And we bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. I've told you earthly things and you didn't believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Yet more confusion shows up on Nicodemus' face. Now we're talking about ascending and descending. Where did this enter the conversation from? And then Jesus clarifies in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Numbers 21, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Oh, that same theme from Numbers 21, to look and live, to believe in him and have eternal life. Either John or Jesus continues to come in verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. This is the judgment, verse 19. The light has come into the world. People loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. If you're still rejecting Jesus Christ as the Savior, that's because your deeds are evil and you love the world more than you love light. That's what Jesus says. Everyone, verse 20, who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed but whoever does what is true comes to the light that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So there Jesus is in a conversation with Nicodemus saying, do you remember that story in the Old Testament about Moses and the bronze snake and the wilderness and Numbers 21? That is a picture of what's gonna happen to me. Jesus says, I'm gonna be placed on a cross and those who look, look to him in faith, will live. I want to look at Paul's comment on that very concept in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. (laughs) 
I'm going to start in verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. Talking about Jesus on the cross, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the word of the cross is foolishness. It's folly to those who are perishing. If you've rejected Jesus Christ as the Savior, this whole business of a crucified Messiah seems stupid to you, does it not? Why would anyone believe in a, in a Messiah who would come not to reign but to be killed on a Roman cross? There's only one reason why you'd believe in a Messiah who came to be killed on a Roman cross. It's because you've been drawn by God to understand by faith the truth that the whole Bible, Old and New Testaments, proclaim. Paul says, the word of the cross, verse 18, is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I'll thwart. Where is the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Yes, he has. Foolish? Put a bronze snake on a pole so that you look at it and therefore you get saved from the bite of the snakes? Foolish? Take the Messiah who has been prophesied for millennia, have him come, live for 30-some years, and then die a horrible death on a cross as a criminal? Foolish? God made foolish the wisdom of the world. For since, verse 21, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through its wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. You know, Jews demand signs. Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews. Folly or foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The foolishness of God, verse 25, is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. You're, you're not that smart. You're just average. Most of you were C students, if truth be told. We're just normal people. Not many were powerful. You don't exercise that much pull. You think you do, especially if you're a local celebrity. Not many were of noble birth. I think we're all commoners. But God chose, verse 27, what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose us. He chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are that no human being might boast in the presence of God. In Ephesians, Paul would say it like this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that no man may boast. Yeah, because of him, verse 30, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. You want to boast? Boast in him. And even Paul in his ministry didn't come to the Corinthians with, with silver or a silver-tongued oratory. Paul came to the Corinthians with plain language to explain to them the beauty of a Messiah who was placed on a cross, that those who have been drawn to God by his Spirit might look and live. Is that you? Is that you tonight? Are you one of those commoners, one of those low people, one of those C students who have been drawn by God to himself and therefore look up in faith and see a Christ crucified on a cross paying the penalty for your sins and for mine. And what does God demand that we do? Look and live. Our banner Moses in Exodus 17, snake on a pole in Numbers 21. Jesus picking up on that theme in John 3, and then Paul explaining it carefully for us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2. So as we gather around the table tonight, let's remember Jesus Christ is our banner. 
We're going to celebrate communion, and before we leave, we're going to sing, look, and live. Gentlemen, will you join me? bow together. Father, tonight we thank you for your precious son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we believe that he came willingly and he gave his life for us at the cross. We pray tonight, Father, that none of us would take that for granted. As time goes on, Father, the cross is going to become more and more and more diminished in our culture, in our society. Help us, Father, as children of Jesus Christ to stand strong and always look so we can live. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. When Jesus had given thanks, he took the bread and broke it, and he said, This is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to celebrate 
do our supper. We ask, Lord, that if there is anybody here that has not said yes, that they would do so this evening, Lord, and for the rest of us, let's join in. We ask that you would be with us as we join in celebration. Lord, we thank you for this day and all that you've blessed us with. In Jesus' name, amen. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul would continue, As often as you do this, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Guys, do you want to rejoin your wives? I don't know if you like sitting with your wife or not, but if you do, go ahead. The song Look and Live with the half sheet insert inside of the other insert song that Ken had us sing tonight. Words will be on the screen, I'll bet you. I have a message from the Lord, hallelujah. The message to you I'll give, just recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. If you're able, I'll invite you to stand with me. Let's sing these four stanzas together.
is no other way. There's no other means of salvation. You've been bitten by that snake of sin, and there is no fix except looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Rejoice with one another before you leave tonight. Thank you. You're dismissed.